I like taking chances. I don't know what it is about me, but I feel like I've always been pulled towards stuff that some people say is unnecessary or crazy <laughs> or high risk. And um, when you do that, you uh, have to be ready to crash and burn sometimes. So you probably noticed that I like to hop into the comment section on every video, just hop, hop, hop in. And I heart a lot of comments. I respond to a lot of comments. I also get a good laugh at a lot of these comments. Like when I mentioned my age a few videos ago, not that it's like, it's not a secret. I'm 37 years old, but a lot of people were like very complimentary. Like this comment, CVV is 37? How? When? I'm sorry, what? Or this one, Chris bro. You are 37? Whoa, you good. Now this one really stood out to me. <laughs> I can never get past Chris's super smooth Botoxed out forehead. It makes his smile look super ingenuine. Well, first of all, the word you're looking for is disingenuous. Ingenuine is, is not a word. But is this the smile you're talking about? That seems like a really mean comment. And I guess when you think about it, it, it is really mean, but it's actually probably one of the nicest things anyone's ever said about me. At 37 years old, this forehead looks Botoxed out? Thank you very much, sir. When I started taking care of my skin a few years ago, that's when I really started to notice a difference. And I know there's a lot of guys that are watching this right now that either A, don't wash their face, or B, you wash your face using the same soap that you wash the rest of your body. T. Shanley has been my go-to skincare routine, mostly because they make this so incredibly easy. They show you exactly what to use and how much of it to use. The wash is great, I use it twice a day, but this bad boy right here has been a complete game changer. The AM Moisturizer, because it has that SPF 20 in it. Now you're probably saying this sounds great, but this sounds expensive. Well, T. Shanley has cut out the middleman so they can sell directly to you at affordable prices. And because they're sponsoring this video, if you click the link down below this video, they'll send you this free toiletry bag from T. Shanley. And it says it right there. This is what it's all about. Uncomplicated skincare for men. Click that link and get started for just $25. Now let's get to it. My chat with John Morrison. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me into your home. Well, the good thing about inviting you over here means that I didn't have to drive anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> there's really Which no is extra convenience. There's really no LA traffic right now, though. There's, it's coming back. Uh, have you noticed that? The little little five is starting to fill up a little bit. A little bit. Yeah, look, I would expect nothing else than to be surrounded by workout and fighting equipment in your home. It's, a, it's you know, it's the quarantine, it's the pandemic. You have to have a pretty sweet home gym. This is, and, when we're, and we're only seeing just a little bit of it. And, and that actually is a floor model of the uh, exercise equipment placed by my house. Because when I got to Big <laughs> Five originally, they were sold out of dumbbells. And I was shocked. I was like, the general public beat me to the dumbbells? <laughs> How did that happen? So you're yeah. like, well, if I can't get dumbbells, I'll just buy this giant thing here. Yeah, and that turned out to be like the, the best move. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because you can do pretty much everything if you've got a pull-up bar. I mean, you look like you're not, you know, you're no slouch here. This is just self-tanner. A lot of blood, sweat, and tanner. So if I put a whole bunch of tanner on, I'll look like this. Next time we do an interview, uh -huh. I'll, the day before, we'll do like a whole like a TV wrestling prep on you. Shave, tanner, the whole deal. Diuretics, I everything. I, I don't know if anybody wants to see that, but... Um, I don't know if people want to see it or not. I just think it'd be interesting. Dandelion root? Oh, man, come on. Is it amateur hour? It's oh, the organic stuff. Geez. You need you need the chemicals. Jeez, I'm sorry. <laughs> Actually, I don't know what's in there. Dandelion root is in there. That, that's one like, of the uh, things, you know, right? Just the, the natural diuretics type stuff you get from GNC. Yeah. yeah, right. So I watched your film yesterday, Speed of Time, and I loved it. Thank you. Um, I'm really excited about the speed of time. I'm, I'm excited for people to check it out. I feel like it's the strongest thing that I've done. And um, basically, the cool thing about, I mean, obviously wrestling, is you get this instant feedback from the crowd. But yeah. in film, is um, getting the reaction from people who watch what you did. And uh, that's happening on Thursday with speed of time. And I'm really excited. Well, the, the thing is, with a match, 
it kind of happens and then you know you have another match a few days later a week later whatever with a film this thing like lives on forever it's eternal yeah um it's it's true you uh the amount of matches that you can have in a year especially if you're on a full-time wwe road schedule uh pre-lockdown <laughs> right <laughs> is i mean 200 250 even yeah so if you think about it like the sheer number of that every night is a uh, is crazy. You just leave a big footprint out there versus a project like The Speed of Time, which, um, I mean, we did it pretty quickly, uh, but you're, it's going to take at least a year. And I, I think we, from the time we started writing Speed of Time till now, now it's been a year and a half. So, but it's still relatively fast. So the concept here is this is a time travel movie. Yep. You're traveling back in time to help your other version of yourself. Yes. So... Um, Johnny Killfire is, uh, is my name from the future. And um, the gist of it is I go back in time to stop myself from creating a pizza app that destroys the space-time continuum. The space-time continuum gets destroyed and these time borgs show up and wreak havoc on the Earth. So the only responsible thing to do is go back in time and prevent myself, young me, from doing that. But, but young you really isn't that much younger than you, and I love the joke in the movie. Stem cells. <laughs> Stem cells. That's how you look young, stem cells. Yeah, everyone knows stem cells. And the, uh, ironically, um, so William Stribling and Russ Nickel, both very talented writers that I've been working with for a long time, wrote this. And um, they didn't know that I'd been to stem cells, like get stem cells in Columbia and actually a few weeks ago again in Baltimore at a different clinic. Wow. I'm a stem cell guy. I love those things. I call them stemmies. Um, <laughs> but in the context of the movie, yeah, it's just a, it's a joke. Everyone in the future looks young. What, do you, what part of your body are you getting stem cells on? Um, when I went to Columbia, I got, I got everything. Like I got uh, both knees, ankle, shoulders, elbow, two vertebrae in my back, two in my neck. And um, I felt the biggest results from my joints. So in Baltimore, I went and I got my knees and my elbow done. I don't know if you can see this elbow, but um, I dislocated it oh, about yeah. two years ago. It, and it's, it's making like, a lot of noise. Hold on. Let, yeah. let me put my mic to it when you do that. You can, it's like two not, dry sponges. You know what I mean? Just rubbing them together. <sighs> like there's a, a little That's, uh, bag of nuts and bolts in there. You know? But in all seriousness, it's hard to believe you sitting next to me right now that you're 40 years old. You look great. I'm very immature also. Well, is, that, that helps. helps. Yeah, that Le helps. Legitimately, I think it does help. I think... Um, <laughs> I mean, immature has got negative connotations because whatever. But um, if you think young, usually you stay young. I think that's a good way to put it. Well, also, and you have eight pack abs, you know, stem since, cells too. Yeah, the stem cells, of course. But eight pack abs since you were probably. Were you born with abs? You know, some of the guys in the locker room were actually just asking me the same thing. Um, and maybe not born with them, but I've had a six pack since uh, middle school. But I was also like a bean pole. I was the skinniest kid. Like my freshman year on the wrestling team, I wrestled at 103 pounds. So that means, sure, I had some little abs, but I had like bone arms and bone legs. I had like no meat. And how tall were you? Um, when I started, I must have been 5'3". I, I wrestled at almost the exact same size my freshman year of high school. Really? I was 5'2 and 102 pounds. Yeah. See? And I remember going to a wrestling meet and they didn't have enough people that were as small as me. So I had to wrestle up a weight class and I got destroyed. I remember like there I got so many good wrestling memories, but there was one 64 team invitational in particular where I made it all the way to the finals because I, I, I was pretty good. But also like most of the time, the 103 pound guy is a freshman, a younger guy. And when I got to the finals, the guy that I was wrestling was clearly a senior and he was just like a, it was like I was a boy and here's like a full grown man and he's got like a mustache and he had like all these tats. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember like looking up at my parents and they were both like, get him John. And I looked at this guy and I was like, oh no, <laughs> this, is, this is not gonna go well. And did it not go well? No, it did not go well. <laughs> I, I think he was uh, just about to like beat me uh, technically, which means 15 points or more. Yeah. But instead, he decided to pin me. <laughs> what a nice so, uh, guy. Yeah. yeah. It did not go well. <laughs> so with the concept of speed of time here, what's your favorite time travel film? 
Ooh, that's a that's a tricky question. I, I got to go with Bill and Ted's the original, right? Well, what's I mean, what's your favorite time travel film? My favorite time travel film is the greatest film of all time, Back to the Future. Ooh, that's a good one too. Right, but there's a ton of great time <sighs> travel films. Back to the Future, I forgot about that. Damn it! How could you forget about Back to the Future? I mean, I know the movie, but you just you know when you get a question and yeah, I've just got Bill and Ted's on my mind because I watched the new one recently. Oh, what did you think of it? Uh, it wasn't as good as the original. Well, I mean... Uh, it, it held my attention, though. Yeah. It was cool seeing Keanu and um, Bill S. Preston Esquire, the, uh, that guy. Although you're watching movies with a completely different lens now. Now that you've made movies as an actor, now that you've made movies as a writer and a producer, you put a movie on now and you're kind of like, oh, interesting choice. Taya brings that up all the time and says that I ruined movies for her. <laughs> because... I do. Like, I'll, I'll call stuff out. I'll be like, oh, like, the boom just like, dipped into the top of the shot there for a second. Or like, that's a weird shadow of the camera guy. Oh, look at the reflection. You can see something there. Or that line right there. That's all ADR. They didn't get that. There's no way. It's not clean. But I, I point that stuff out. And um, that's, like, that's like the negative stuff that I pick on. <laughs> but the, uh, the positive is um, when you think about the storytelling and how they're doing it, it's a much more productive and interesting way to watch movies. Yeah. And, and I do that too. Which of your films are you most proud of? Boone, for yeah. sure. Boone the Bounty Hunter. Yeah. I mean, that's the only one that I did the whole process for. Like, wrote, produced, action design. Um, and I can't say I directed or uh, edited it, but I was involved in the post process. And, um, and I acted it, you know? Yeah, no. And uh, it, that, one was a, that one was a labor of love. And it felt like... Uh, I mean, basically, that was the reason that I left WWE, not specifically to make Boo and the Bounty Hunter, but to have creative autonomy. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And we were talking about that before we even started, like the idea that, hey, I've got this cool idea, like, I want to do it the way I want. Yeah. And uh, not many people get to do that. It is difficult, too. Was, did Boone turn out the way you wanted it to turn out? Um, well, I'm, I'm a perfectionist, so nothing to ever sure. works out the way that I want it to. But close, yeah. yeah. Especially given, oh god, we could talk about Boone forever. <laughs> given like a, what Boone ended up being, yes. I mean, the first script of Boone was written as maybe a ten million dollar action movie, and um, I tried to raise money for that ten million dollar action movie, and quickly realized that uh, no one's gonna give a first time pro wrestler filmmaker ten million bucks to make. Boone. So um, as the drafts went, it pr progressively became cheaper and cheaper <laughs> with, while maintaining the character integ integrity. And um, it ended up, I mean, I think it ended up being perfect. Like it's, it, it's hard to like look back and say like this, that, like I could have changed a few things here and there yeah. and I could have, but um, the best thing for me to do is just uh, look at it and use all those lessons for the next thing. And Actually, and, and Speed of Time is a great yeah. example of like an evolution. That's the next thing. And you did like, you did like some fight coordination on this film. Like your, your resume with the film stuff is now stacked. Well, it's fun. I like doing yeah, this yeah. stuff. So Boone integrates pro wrestling, parkour, and some traditional stunt choreo. And Speed of Time is very similar because my fortes are parkour and pro wrestling. And um, so Speed of Time is pro wrestling, parkour, some traditional stunt choreo, and laser guns. Yeah, there are laser guns. Yeah. So, say in Boone, I hit a Canadian destroyer uh, off a wall run onto a guy, <laughs> and it was the first thing we hit in the speed of time. Canadian destroyer, but then when the guy pops up, like, pop, 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 yeah. like laser gun, shoot him right in the head. And I, th I think, to me, that's the interesting thing about um, having the creative autonomy to pitch these crazy ideas in the action design. Yeah, so where can people see Speed of Time? Oh, Speed of Time on September 17th. This Thursday will be released internationally on a platform called Dust. They have a YouTube channel, a Facebook page, and an IGTV gimmick, all of which will be streaming the Speed of Time. And if you do watch the Speed of Time, please comment, let me know what you think, um, tag me, Tag him. Tag, tag everybody. Me. Tag people. You know, and uh, tell your friends, family, and frenemies to uh, do the same. And tag Dolph Ziggler. It's a nice surprise Ooh. that out of nowhere, yeah. Dolph Ziggler shows up. Dolph Ziggler is um, from the future also. And, you know, in the future, I guess, in the speed of time world, when you take stem cells, 
You come back ripped with long hair. That's the secret. Yeah, I think that's what happens. <laughs> we were joking about it on set so much. Like, not only do stem cells like keep you young and fix stuff, but in, in the speed of time, they also give you like kind of '80s glam rock hair. <laughs> you guys both look great, though. Well, I feel like a billion pesos. That's. I guess that's a lot of money still. I guess it's pretty good. Someone's like doing the calculation right now, going, "Yeah, yeah that's a solid amount of money." That's a good yeah yeah. It's it's good to see you back in WWE. It, like you were gone for a long time. You were gone for almost nine years. Yeah. Did you ever think you'd be back? Um, when I first left, I thought that I was going to be back in a year or two. I thought I was going to leave WWE. Um, I hadn't thought of Boone the Bounty Hunter, but I left because I wanted to make a movie mm. and not just be in a movie, but I'm a film major. I went to UC Davis. That's what I studied in school. So I wanted to do the whole process, write, produce, star, work on the action design. And um, when I left, I thought that was going to take a year, maybe two. <laughs> nope. That's how, not how movies work. How long work. did it take in total? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the whole process from like coming up with the idea till like the release is five years. Wow. Like that, I mean, it took a really long time and um, I could probably do it a lot faster now sure. because I uh, could avoid some of the pitfalls. But um, so I had always intended to go back to WWE and um, as the years went by, I kept in touch. I never, uh, I was never on bad terms with anyone. And I remember whenever they were in LA, I'd visit and um, I want to say like 2016, 17, I had a conversation with Carano, and he said, uh, we'd love to have you back, although if you sign again with Lucha Underground, um, it's probably not going to happen. Oh. And I signed again with Lucha. <laughs> was that... Was so it wasn't like a, like a screw you WWE thing. It was just like... Um, Take the sure I, thing? Well, it wasn't even, it's not even a sure thing. It was just I was in, still not finished with Post on Boone. I was in the midst of things. I had a lot of things going. Lucha Underground, I liked. I always feel like that's an underrated show that a lot oh, of people missed out on. Everyone would agree with that. For and sure. um, they uh, made me a really, really nice offer, Lucha Underground did. And um, I took it in a nervous way because, um, you know, you always want to finish where you start, or for me in wrestling, especially if you start at WWE, like you want to finish at the highest level. And I'd always seen um, having my final run at WWE. So um, when I hit uh, like Vince up and Chrono up about coming back, I was uh, really excited when they seemed interested. I'll put it that way. I love that you, I could just hit Vince up. Yeah, what's up, Vince? I wasn't, I wasn't very casual about it. I gotta say I was a little bit nervous, but um, that's what I did. Wow. So if you're, is this your final run then? I mean, yeah. You still but, look amazing, but though. By final run, let me like explain what a run is. I mean, I'm still on like a what, like a 17 year run from when I started. So this fi this like final run could mean like five years, more, 10 years, 15 years. Who 17. knows? 17 more yeah. years. Yeah. That, that, that's what I mean. I, like I whatever whatever happens, I'd, I'd like to finish out at WWE. Yeah. I mean, look, it's been so great. Hopefully, in front of people. <laughs> Fans. Hopefully that's soon. At least you got to debut in front of fans. Yeah. I, as a fan, I wanted to see you debut at the Rumble. I thought that that would have made a lot of sense. Um, I don't know. I'm laughing right now because I, I debuted in a backstage vignette with Miz. And um, if you really think about it, my debut was, hey, is, um, <laughs> is Miz there? Here's John Morrison. Nope. Miz isn't talking right now. Thanks. See ya. And closed the door. So basically, my debut was telling uh, the interviewer that Miz was unavailable. And I walked uh, after that aired, and they were following me with cameras for the Chronicle, and saw Ziggler, like, we kind of, like, crossed in the hallway, and he just goes, like, hey, sweet debut, bro. <laughs> and we high-fived, both, like, super sarcastically. And they put that in the Chronicle, and I was like, dude, that's my favorite part of the Chronicle. <laughs> hey, sweet debut, bro. Thanks, man. Yeah, I'm back. <laughs> what was the plan that you had in mind? Um, it, it's tough to have a plan because um, I, I found with WWE, if you have a plan and it's like, I want to wrestle this person and do these things, that's not like 
how it works, really. Your plan should be mostly all about you, your character. How do you interact with everybody else on the roster? So I had been and still have been working on that. Like, what, do you, what would I do in the ring against Otis? Obviously, I've done that a lot. Roman against Seth, against Ray, against Buddy Murphy, against Daniel Bryan, Riddle. Like, that, like um, who am I to those people? Like, mm. what is, who is John Morrison? Mm. That's, the, that's the key to figuring out where you fit into the business. And the answer is different for everybody. Is the John Morrison in 2020 that much different than the John Morrison in 2011 when you left? Definitely, yeah. I mean, the the guy that I am now, I, I know who I am a lot more now, and I know when I know where my sweet spot is. I didn't really understand it in 2011, and um, a lot of it is uh, maturity. I mean, a lot of it's like acting classes, reading acting books, like some kind of in depth character study type mm. things, and then it it comes down to. I mean, we could do a whole two-hour thing about this. I think about this nonstop. Figuring out what it is about you that people want to see. Mm. Like, you specifically. Like, why do people watch Chris? Like, what, like, what do you have? Like, what's, what's your thing? Like, if you come out and you try to act like Batista and be, like, this tough muscle guy, it's not authentic. Yeah. No, one's, no one's buying that. Yeah. Same for me. Yeah. Like, I can't come out like, a, like Brock and, and be, like, the, this behemoth guy because it doesn't... It's not how people perceive me. So figuring out how you're perceived and then picking the part of you that's the most interesting, I sometimes call it shiny, and living in that moment, in that energy all the time is the, is the key. And it's a lot, it's very difficult. You can, I can say that and I can know that, but it doesn't mean I can do it. But it sounds like you've grown as John Morrison, the performer, and also John Hennigan, the man. Yeah, and and also I, I realized that um, those two things in all of entertainment are a lot more important than uh, I first realized. Like who, like for, for example, Chris the man is very important. Sure. I mean, because you've got your on-screen like um, host, like personality, your real personality. Um, I'm guessing they're probably pretty similar. Similar-ish. I feel like but, when the camera gets turned on, I turn it up. I mean, you have to. You, right. right. We're, otherwise, we're, it gets we're communicating to, yeah. to people. Yeah. But um, I guess to your, to your point, being um, more self-aware or knowing the more all-encompassing version of yourself after a bunch of authentic introspection gives you a fuller picture of you or gives me a fuller picture of me. Yeah. And then when you take that full picture, you go to some sort of entertainment venue, wrestling, and say like, okay, um, this is the real me. Now what parts of this are gonna fit in there? Mm. And for, uh, for acting, sometimes it's very little. Wrestling, it's a lot more and you're playing that character for a lot longer. Yeah. But man, like, uh, you know, like I said, that, this is the kind of stuff that like, I kick around my head 24-7, nonstop. It's, a, it, it, it's like communication, it's star quality, that it factor, the sh being shiny, all, like figuring that out. And um, I guess if anyone really does figure it out, they end up becoming like The Rock or Stone Cold yeah. or uh, Jason Momoa or Chris Hemsworth or whoever sure. like, we're talking about. That's... That's somebody who's authentically matching up the shiniest parts of themselves with the way they're perceived and delivering. I find this just fascinating. So where did this process begin for you of finding the shiniest parts of yourself? Um, I mean, really wrestling, right? Mm -hmm. And I wasn't uh, self-aware enough to like go into this type of introspective like, state You know, when I first started. When I first started at OVW, I remember thinking like, uh, if, uh, if I told a joke or like um, did something heelish to like Capitelli, for example, like if uh, we did a push spot where I pushed somebody over and they fell on their back, like I would almost break character and laugh for two reasons. One, because I thought it was funny, but two, because I was so excited that I was in the ring and I did something <laughs> that worked. Yeah. So that like completely used to like pull me out of things. Like I would be in the ring and the Undertaker's music hits. 
or Jeff Hardy's music hits. And like sometimes I would just be like in the ring. And it's almost like subconscious. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, I, I guess because I was such a fan of uh, the business and entertainment and I like having fun, that, uh, that type of stuff still affects me. But um, it has to be just contained because that distorts your power, basically, your energy or wh whoever you are in the moment. That takes away from it, unless it's a conscious yeah. choice. It, it sounds like you couldn't have got to this place if you hadn't left WWE. And, uh, you know, completely you, right. You did so many amazing no, things no, no, after that's, that. That's, that's completely right, because a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about is um, like acting type stuff, acting character work. And um, it's, it's frustrating. And one, one thing, uh, God, one, man, there's a couple things. There's so many, actually, more than a couple things. There's so many things. <laughs> but um, what I was going to say is people watch entertainment to feel something. Um, it's the simplest way that you can describe it. Actually, it's a Vince McMahon quote. Television is a feeling. He said that. That's what it is. That's why people watch. That's why people watch entertainment. It doesn't mean it has to be tragic or dramatic or comedic or anything. It just any feeling, mm. right? Yeah. Um, in order to be on camera and communicate those feelings, you have to be vulnerable, raw, uncomfortable unbalanced sometimes yeah and it's hard it, it's hard to walk around and carry all these like crazy emotions that feel like they're tearing you apart but if you can do that and you can contain that energy that's star quality mm. that's that's what it is i think there's a lot of people especially in the acting world that when they're starting out they go oh i just feel so stupid doing this Right. That's not, I wouldn't do that. And it's like, no, the, of course you wouldn't do that. You're not doing that. The character you're playing is doing that. Completely. Yeah. It, it, exactly. Like um, in Glorious Bastards, for example, um, is, uh, are the Nazis in that, would they really kill Jewish people? No. No, it's a movie. Yeah. Clearly. Yeah. And thank God, it's, it's just a movie. But in, uh, in wrestling, same thing. Would, uh, would John Morrison like look over and see a guy eating a ham and say, like, hey, you fat turd cutter, why don't you eat a salad? <laughs> I forgot about <laughs> turd cutter. It's one of my favorite words. But um, <laughs> that's the, I mean, that, that's in character, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. I guess if the cameras aren't rolling, then it's not, but <laughs> no. But um, when you say that on TV, that, that's in character. Yeah, yeah. We, when you first left WWE... Actually, here's, here's a funny little thing for you that okay. might, might sidebar you to something that you wanted to ask me about. No, I've got um, all kinds of time. When I did Survivor, they did a background check. And um, they look for any potential negative or offensive thing that you've said throughout your entire life. Guess how long my background check was? <laughs> Probably pretty long. 200 pages. Wow. 200 pages. A lot of turn and, cutters on there? Um, they had like... I think one of my favorites was they had a picture of me in the ring with a blazer looking like real smug like this. And I had diamonds on my abs. And it, um, it says, uh, in an instance in 2009, Hennigan opened a blazer and said, the diamonds on my abs are worth more than enough to deport every illegal alien from this city, referring <laughs> to <laughs> Latin Americans in San Diego. <laughs> and I was like, but... <laughs> I didn't even write that one. They wrote, it was clearly part of the show. Yeah. But it's just funny to go through that report and like read like someone who uh, really academically like broke down <laughs> just how <laughs> I was offensive. But obviously it wasn't too offensive because you got on Survivor. <laughs> but that was the funny thing too. I was like, when I, I looked at the thing, I like called him and I was like, hey guys, like this is all in character stuff. You know that, right? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We just do these background checks. Like those, the stuff that we uh, reported was just what we found. Is there's, there, we didn't find any red flags. <sighs> Jeez. But two hundred of those things, each little individual instan like instance. Wow. So I was like, I was going to say, when you left WWE in 2011, did you instantly go, "Oh my gosh, now I'm free to do whatever I wanted," or did you have a moment where you went, oh, "Maybe I should have stayed." Um. 
the maybe I should have stayed moment usually doesn't come for a year or two. Okay. When you leave, you're <laughs> glad to be gone. The world is there. You can take whatever you want. You're free. Your time is your own. Um, it's uh, not having a paycheck for a couple of years that then you kind of start thinking like, oh, shoot, maybe I should have stayed. <laughs> Maybe I'd have a house were, instead of a movie. Yeah, but you were still, you were still working with Impact, MLW, Lucha Underground. True, but like, I mean, WWE is, um, is the biggest and the best organization of them all. It always will be. And um, I loved wrestling. I clearly never stopped. Yeah. But um, I, I mean, yeah, I guess to, to your point, to that answer that question, um, I didn't feel that way. I never really did, actually. Hmm. Because I felt like every time... I just felt like as far as wrestling went, there was so many opportunities and I was having fun. Like AAA, Lucha Underground, Impact Wrestling, like Five Star Wrestling in the UK, all these little independent promotions that were really good yeah. that I got to wrestle for. And um, I'm glad I did it. Like I, I don't think that... Uh, actually, a lot of guys in the roster that came up from the independent scene did that they were there I never was because I was from tough enough yeah but being able to see what that is all those people hustling trying so hard wrestling in small buildings with packed crowds wrestling in small buildings with no crowds yeah that like a to me as far as my wrestling experience was missing and it would have always been missing if I didn't leave you joke about like if I didn't make a movie I'd still have a house is that a sore spot for you like you sold your house to finance Boone oh um I'm uh, yeah I, I joke about it, but um, but it was a pretty sweet beach house in Manhattan Beach. Let yeah. me tell you. Yeah. The, Manhattan every, Beach every is once pretty in a while sweet. I, I drive by that thing and I look up and, <sighs> damn it. <laughs> <laughs> you'll, I bet you there's one day you'll go back, you'll be able to buy it back. Yeah. You absolutely could. Yep. Glass is half full. Oh, I'm sorry. Another, <laughs> another few no, years I, I, at WWE? And, uh, honestly, two things. Yes, and... Uh, Second thing, I'm I'm, I'm joking. Um, the uh, the reason <laughs> but not I made really. the, no, but the reason I made Boone wasn't to like make money. I knew that. Yeah. And uh, if I didn't do what I did, I would have just left and not had a movie. And yeah. so I wouldn't do anything different. Yeah. What, at what point did you start thinking? Maybe I should get in touch with WWE. It'd be cool um, to go back. When uh, so when season four of Lucha ended, they have like a, they have some stuff. With, on their contracts where there's a tail and the tail doesn't start until the episodes stop airing. And um, so I'd signed with Impact. And uh, when everything was free and clear, I decided um, I'm a free agent again, completely free, like no ties anywhere. I'm going to figure out where I want to go. So I talked to WWE and I talked to AEW and um, I had a really good conversation with Vince. I, and um, they made me a really nice offer, and I ended up taking it. And now you're back with your best friend, The Miz. It's great. Yeah. You know, <laughs> greatest tag team of the 21st century. <laughs> Wait a minute. You got to do the oh, look at me. Sorry. Yeah. So we, you got to look that way, kind of, and then up that way. The greatest tag team of the 21st century. I, I kind of did it. I'm, yeah, it I'm counts. No Miz. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was great to see you on an episode of Miz and Mrs. Oh, Miz is like crushing wait, dude, it with that wait, stuff. Wait until... Uh, we have like a bromance episode and uh, <laughs> I think it's going to air in like December maybe or January. I don't know. But um, I'm not going to say anything aside from the fact that um, <laughs> we watched a rough cut together at the, uh, at the TV hotel and um, we're dying laughing. <laughs> and part of me also said, it was like, man, like, are we just a couple of jerks just laughing at ourselves on a reality show? Cause it's us. Yeah. I hope not. So hopefully when people see it, they think it's funny too. And <laughs> Were you surprised at all that Miz got a reality show? Nope. Yeah. I can, he's, nope. He was like Mr. Reality Show in the 2000s. And he's very involved in Miz and Mrs. I mean, he, he's, him and Maurice both are executive producers. Oh, wow. But um, they're not vanity credits. He's, he's giving notes on rough cuts. He's coming up with stories. He's working with the producers. Wow. He's, he's earning that EP credit which I think is cool because when I'm in the car with him and I get to listen to these phone calls and like he's talking about the A, B, C story. Yeah, yeah. And like um, USA has got different notes than Buna Murray, the production company has. So it's, uh, it's actually been fascinating for me to so you're, uh, kind of listen to some of that. You're taking these notes so that you and Taya can have your own show. That's what you're saying. Potentially. Wow. I mean, I've always been more of a scripted guy, to be honest. So what's like, 
pie in the sky scripted idea. What is it for you? You know, the, the funny thing is I've had, um, when I left, I have all these like weird ideas that aren't like hundred million dollar movies, but, um, William Wallace Sasquatch Hunter is a, <laughs> is one that I like. I got a beat sheet for it. It's pretty sweet. I'd watch that. Descendant of William Wallace. His name's Billy. He works for Scotland Yard. He's trying to bust a drug ring. He gets suspended, goes to the highlands of Scotland when his grandma tells him that he actually is a descendant of William Wallace. Then a Sasquatch takes his high school sweetheart and they realize that the Sasquatches have been smuggling these drugs. He gets killed by a Squatch, then resurrected and has Sasquatch-like powers. Wow. So that's just one. I got, wow. I got, I got some others. Too. I mean, you were in Sharknado 5. I feel like that's a kind of a Sharknado-ish story. Oh, I got one for you. I mean, if we're, if we're rolling, actually, hold, hold the fort down. I'm going to grab the barricade poster. It's just over there. Oh, okay. Oh, my God. Well, they won't be able to hear you as much as if you're over there. But we're, Wow, John's bringing a poster over here. Okay. Oh. That wouldn't get... Okay, this, no, you weren't. You weren't kidding. One. Um, we can put it behind us, I think. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll get to like, hold it back here. Okay. So this is another kind of idea that would be fun. And since you said Sharknado, this is very Sharknado. -y. Oh, it's both of you guys. Yes. Yeah. So this is me and Ty. We Bear got Presley. Hurricane. If you think about it, it's uh, a hurricane with bears, <laughs> you know? It's prehistoric bears, koala bears, brown bears, black bears, grizzly bears. And your dog's even in this. Oh, yeah, the dog's in Speed of Time, too. Let yeah. See. see him? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, There's going to be people that are watching this that think you're joking. Oh, I got a Barricane song and everything. Can yeah, I, no, he's not did, joking. Did a, did a knockoff on that uh, Scorpions, like, rock you like a hurricane. Run away, it's a Barricane. <sighs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not joking. I got a lot of weird ideas. Do you have, like, any, like, super dramatic, like, it's like serious ideas? Nope. <laughs> the most serious one that I have is, uh, ooh, this will be fun. We can develop this together with people watching. Here we go. Someone it's, watching uh, this is going to finance your film. It's not necessarily called Quick Souls, but the idea is souls are born into the world with only four days to live, to figure out what it means to be human and fulfill their potential and then in the last hour of their life, they have kind of a superpower hour, and then they expire. Mm. So it's uh, partly inspired by Blade Runner, because the Blade Runner's only had four years to live, four years. Yeah. But this is four days. So the crux of this is uh, there's a villain and a hero, and they're both kind of friends, but then they both quickly realize the villain's purpose is to hurt and destroy, and the hero's purpose is to save, but the hero falls in love with another soul, quick soul, and he has to choose between spending time with the woman he loves and saving people he doesn't know from this other guy. So that's pretty serious. You got a lot of ideas up there. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was also thinking Suburban Commando too. I mean, that's a, <laughs> who wouldn't want to watch that? <laughs> What's your favorite movie of all time? Uh, Rumble in the Bronx. Okay. Yep. Second favorite movie of all time. Drunken Master 2. I have not seen that. Really? Sorry. Drunken Master 2 might be the greatest uh, kung fu movie of all time. Hey, you are a kung fu guy. I'm, I'm biased to Rumble in the Bronx because it's the first Jackie Chan movie I've seen in the theater. Okay. And when I was a kid, I skateboarded to the theater and watched that like 10 times in, oh the, the, in wow. the theater. But Drunken Master 2, I think, is Jackie's strongest movie. Is he your favorite actor of all time? Um, my favorite action actor of all time. Okay. Yeah. I like, had the privilege of interviewing him for like 15 minutes. What? Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah, it was, it was like three years ago. You, normally those TV interviews like at, four minutes. At the end of this interview, I want to I see some of this Jackie Chan thing. He was so great. It was so, oh, he's so great. So kind. Yeah. Who's your favorite actor then of all time? If he's your favorite action star of all time. Man. Um... Bruce Willis is up there for me, mm. uh, especially early Willis. Did you see Moonlighting, by the way? It's no. The, his very first thing. Die Hard would definitely be my first introduction to him. Um, he perfected his uh, Die Hard shtick on Moonlighting. Oh. Which is um, it's a good, it's, it's very interesting to watch young Bruce Willis on Moonlighting. I'll have to um, look this up. I'm trying to think of other guys that I, that I dig. Hemsworth I like. Um, I think Tom Hardy might be the best actor out there right now. 
He's very good. Yeah. How about you? Favorite actor? Of all time, I think that when you have a movie with like DiCaprio, you know it's going to be so good. I don't know. You qualified it though. With what? When you have a movie with DiCaprio, it's oh, going to be good. Well, like that's what I'm movie. saying. But no, but I'm saying that okay. he makes the movie great. Okay, okay. His perfor- gotcha. You know his performance is going to be so good. So I think that he's definitely someone that I go, oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, he's, he's up there for me, too. Daniel Day-Lewis, unbelievable. Yeah. Mark Ruffalo, so underrated because... Let me, let me ask you this, though. The Revenant, right? Yeah. Um, DiCaprio and Tom Hardy. Good example to me of uh, Tom Hardy acting circles around DiCaprio. Now, here's the thing. I don't think, and we could get into this whole tangent here, but... This is subjective. There's no answers. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I'm not saying that The Revenant was Leonardo DiCaprio's best performance, but I think that he was owed the Oscar for Wolf of Wall Street, and I think they looked at Revenant and went, ah, oh, I feel like we maybe, maybe we missed out there. I agree. I, yeah, that makes sense to me. Because, I mean, you got Tom Hardy acting circles around him, and then that bear. Who that the bear, bear was, yeah. The bear was very good. Wasn't even a real bear. It looks so good, though. The bear didn't get nominated. The bear did not get nominated. The bear got would, snubbed. Would you ever shave your head for a role? Uh, it would depend on the role. Okay. Big time. And I've, I've had that question asked to me a couple of times for, uh, for smaller projects, and I've always said no. Hmm. That makes sense. I mean, it took you a long time to have these luscious locks that you have now. And... It, um, it would actually, I mean, it probably won't happen now, but um, for a while I was thinking when I was a AAA champion that it would be cool at some point to have like a, a mask versus hair match because yeah. for, for someone who's had long hair since tough enough like me, yeah. um, the hair actually means something. Yeah. And I mean, masks obviously mean something too. Well, sure. Would you ever cut your hair like, like tough enough, John? Sure. Like, um, okay. man, my, my dad asks me that same question almost every week. <laughs> I'd, uh, yeah, I'd consider that. I, was, I remember being so blown away when you won Tough Enough. I went, yeah, of course this guy's going to win tough, tough Enough. He looks like a million bucks. And then you went off TV and then you came back and you were huge. And I remember going like, this guy's massive now. So what was the conversation like when they well, said, like, you got to put some mass on? It's not so much of a conversation as they... They mentioned that, yeah, like you got to size up, you got to bulk up, but also when you're there realistically, <laughs> me and Matt Capitelli walk into OVW fresh off Tough Enough, um, and there's 50 hungry guys that have been there for years that are all 220 to 300 pounds. Yeah, and what were you? Seasoned pro wrestlers. I'm like at this point like 185. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm famous from MTV, and so we go out and like. People are like, oh, my God, it's Matt and John from Tough Enough. And, like, these other guys that are just so much bigger and really nice and polished and um, just ring generals are around. And um, no one really had to say, like, uh, hey, dude, if you want to be a professional wrestler, you need to bulk up a little bit. Yeah. It's just, uh, it was almost like it it went without saying. Although, um, (laughs) what did JR, like, Jim Ross came down, and um, he has a funny way of saying everything. He's like. If you want to draw money in this business, you got to have a good upper body, good, good pecs, shoulders, and biceps. Forget about your legs. No one gives a good goddamn about your calves. You might get a pat on the ass for your quads, but that's it. Like, that, was, that was JR's advice. Wow. So how much did you went from 185 to what? Um, I mean, I'm 210 now, so it's not really that crazy if you think about that it. That still it's just, is a lot of size. The, uh, the thing is... <laughs> People usually think I'm a lot bigger when they see me on TV. Um, example, when I was tagging with Miz, uh, who was 220 at the time, whenever we went to his parents' house, his dad would always be like, God, Michael, you've just got to get bigger like John. Look how much bigger than you he is. And he would always be like, Dad, I am. I'm 220. He's 210. He's like, well, he looks bigger. He just looks a lot bigger. And um, Mike's like, well, well, thanks, Dad. Do you know why that is? It's because I'm fat, okay? <laughs> Thanks, Dad, for pointing that out again. Uh, do you, do but you staying th- lean is the tricky part. Well, you're very lean, though. You're very lean. Do you think that you're the most successful person to come off t- tough enough? Um, Definitely the if, most successful winner. If you don't, the most successful winner for sure. If, uh, it depends if you count Miz as coming off tough enough or not. Well, why wouldn't you? Sure. Because he was on that like, weird season that wasn't like yeah. a real season. Um, then no, 
I mean, I, I can't so say Miz, that I've okay. had a more successful career than The Miz. Yeah. You had a more successful career than Maven. Yes. Um, and most, actually, all the winners. Like everybody. For sure. All um, the winners, yeah. Ex- everyone except Miz. I, I mean, I think that guy's just really uh, had his nose to the grindstone and been bootstrapping it for years and proved everybody wrong. And uh, yeah. now, you know, they probably paid off for him because he yeah. finally gets to tag again with John Morrison. <laughs> <laughs> that's the ultimate prize. You made it. <laughs> <laughs> Is there something specific that you learn from Miz or you have learned from Miz? And you've known him for you know, two decades now. Like one thing? <laughs> um, You're saying you know, just a lot of, like a lot of, uh, no, it's like, I was like, mm, let me think of all the stuff that I've learned from Miz and try to pick one. Um, Cause I've, lo- I've learned a lot from the guy. Um, I'll go back to some of that energy stuff that we were talking okay, about. Okay, yeah. So he's always been really authentically himself, right? And um, I don't think he was ever as introspective as I am about it because I drive myself nuts, like, taking notes and writing stuff down and ideas and, like, a line that Errol Flynn might have said in the movie Robin Hood in the 30s. And then, like, oh, what, what did Bruce... Will, like, stuff like that that's, like, almost, like, obsessive. But um, what he's always done is be authentically himself. So there's no cracks in like him and his character and there's no, there's no gaps basically. Mm. I, I believe him. Yeah. That's, I think the biggest factor in success or failure in entertainment. Yeah. If you have cracks and people see through you, it shatters that theatrical reality. Yeah. The suspension of disbelief. And, um, it, you feel like, Oh, this is, I feel dumb. I feel insulted. I feel like changing the channel. So, because he never does that, I think I attribute a lot of what he's achieved to that. Mm. Well, Mike is the Miz. Yeah. And the Miz is Mike. And I think that's... Right. Yeah. I think. And, and, you know, on TV, like, like you've got like kind of an arrogant, brash character. And then there's also the parts of him that are a really loyal friend and a guy that's fun to ride with and tells stories and um, wants to work out sometimes. Not all the time, but, so, but sometimes. <laughs> Oh, man, I'm sorry, Miz. <laughs> so he's the guy you're riding with now? I guess yeah, I mean, riding. I'm not riding with anyone now. Yeah, it's, uh, it's all just, just locked down. But, uh, but yeah, when I, when I came back, it, it's usually easiest to ride if you're, a, if you're in a tag team yeah. with your partner because um, you can, you'll, you're in the same match, so you show up and leave at the same time. You usually get booked on appearances together. Yeah. And the, if you're in a car with, like, four guys and, like, suddenly someone has, like, a weird appearance, so they have to, like... You, the first match guy is riding with the last match guy. Yeah. Like the first match guy wants to like get to the building maybe a little extra early. Yeah. Maybe leave <laughs> at intermission. <laughs> but um, anyway, it usually makes sense to to ride with the guys that you're uh, you're wrestling with. I feel like if we look at WrestleMania this year, mm-hmm. obviously a lot of people are talking about the Boneyard match. A lot of people are talking about the Firefly Fun Funhouse match. But when you talk about the in ring matches, you guys stole the show. And you were wrestling like there was 80,000 people in the performance center. This is great. I would continue. Oh, tell me more. <laughs> tell me more about my great match. Um, uh, thanks. Yeah. And I, like, I, I uh, felt like, um, and I still do feel like I've got a little chip on my shoulder, something to prove. But especially during that match, I, I felt like I had this chip on my shoulder of, of stuff to prove. And it, everything um, worked out for me that time. I uh, I don't necessarily like playing it safe. I like taking chances. Yeah, and there's sure. a couple chances that I took in that match that um, could have gone wrong. The rope walk, for example, um, it's a a really big risk because <laughs> I'm I'm not like a 100 percent on that. I'd say I'm like 50 50. Sometimes I, I when I had the ring in the backyard last time, when yeah, you were yeah. there, I was, I was up to like 70 80 percent. I could make it. But um, I'm glad I took that chance. I'm glad it paid off. The spiral tap out of the corner onto a, onto Ooze on the ladder. Yeah. There's ah, there's a, a lot of things in that match that felt good because I was flying really close to the sun, so to speak. Do you know what I mean? Close enough that like uh, if I had gotten burned, I would have fallen, would have hurt, it would have been awkward. Yeah. And um, I didn't know necessarily if I was going to be able to do some of the things that I tried. 
Was and, it, uh, and they all worked. Was it because you didn't have the adrenaline from the crowd being there? Like you might have been more than 50 50 on the, t- on the no. rope walk. No, 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 no. Um, because when, I, when I'm in the moment, like the crowd gives you adrenaline, but I also just was really locked in that day. Mm. Oh, you can like, tell. Like the ropes, I mean, I have a, like a, a million things. We wanted to talk about specifics, a million things to say about the ropes. But if you keep your eye in the corner and you disrespect the ropes, is what I have in my head. Like, if you rope, you're just a rope. I'm walking on top of you. Um, for some reason, that's like what I tell myself mentally, and that takes me across. Wow. I like taking chances. I don't know what it is about me, but I feel like I've always been pulled towards stuff that some people say is unnecessary or crazy <laughs> or high risk. And um, when you do that, you uh, have to be ready to crash and burn sometimes. And at this year's WrestleMania, some people, yeah, were saying, oh, well, because there's no people, there's probably a lot less pressure. But it didn't feel that way to me because I always get more nervous about failing or crashing or embarrassing myself in front of my family, friends, and coworkers than I would in front of a huge audience. I know that sounds weird, but it's like this little group of people are the people that I respect the most in the yeah. world, and they're all watching me. Like, I feel like, the, I don't know. The pressure was also like, maybe up a little more. This is your first WrestleMania in nine years? Sounds, I'll take your word for it, about right. Yep. Yeah, nine years. Wow. What is your favorite personal WrestleMania moment? Uh, Got to be the moonsault with the ladder in oh, uh, yeah. Orlando, actually. Yeah. WrestleMania 24. All places, yeah. Yeah. Wow. You did that or like when Snoop Dogg's roadie, like that Pope Magic Don Juan, told me that Snoop wanted to buy one of my fur coats. What? That was pretty rad. Hold on. You can't just like say that in like passing. What? Yeah, like the, uh, the it's upstairs, it's upstairs in the floor of the closet. It's, uh, it's a brown thing with leather and crystals and things. I mean, he seemed uh, he seemed very high this guy at the time, and uh, Snoop was also. So I don't even know if they knew what was going on. But they totally would have bought it from you. Uh, probably. You didn't want to. But sell Snoop, it Snoop wasn't there. Well, it was brand new. This is a, like a brand new thing. I got it made just for this WrestleMania. When you get something new, you're not like, oh yeah, here, take it. Because you don't make you don't get like a ring coat made to to make a profit. You know what <laughs> well, I mean? No, that's not that's not how you do that. Wow. Feel like you should have sold. Felt it. pretty cool though. This would be a much better story if you said, "Yeah," and then I sold it, and he like gave me a briefcase of money. Well, if he had a briefcase of money, it might have had a, a different ending to the story. But but I don't know what like like what was he gonna offer me like a you could just like tell a, him like a bag full of blunts yeah you like a, a you'd case like, full of money sure okay you no know, this means a lot to me That's, something like this is gonna be like thirty thousand man I wonder Maybe if he like, still remembers like oh yeah here's thirty thousand there's no way he remembers <laughs> <laughs> when you're on the road full time though it's not like a you're, you're like working so hard and you're, ma- you're making money. You don't really think about, I mean, like the, the carny, like uh, John Morrison, when you're, when you're gone. Oh yeah. You get carny. <laughs> you sell stuff. I've sold for coats and tights. And, like you, you figure out how to make that money. But, sure. but when you're in WrestleMania and you're on the road, that's not what you're thinking about. Yeah. Okay. So that's your second favorite WrestleMania moment. Yeah. yeah probably, probably that's number two. <laughs> so at the end of last year, I had a very long, very interesting interview with Austin Aries. And a lot of the interview was about the match that you guys had at Bound for Glory. And he said that both of you guys like really loved that match, that he said that you said it was one of your favorite matches ever. Is um, that fair? <laughs> yes. It, I, I, it's a match that I'm very proud of, and it's one of my favorite matches. Uh, he might not be one of my favorite people, <laughs> but... It's one of the only times in uh, my career where I feel like everybody, like everybody believed in, in that match, um, including me. It felt real. Like it felt like the two of us had a real issue, and the issue was not resolved before we went out to the ring. So there was so much uncertainty surrounding that match. Yeah. People, including myself, I mean, Taya, uh, Moose, Killer Cross on the outside for, for him were wondering what was going to happen. Yeah. And it feels like that type of moment, that type of situation 
is exactly what wrestling was in the glory days, back when like uh, everything was kayfabed. Everyone thought everything was real. Yeah. But that, in a in its own way, was a real authentic moment. Yeah. And um, because of that, it felt different, and it. Uh, yeah, it, it felt different. It's, it's something that I, I still I think about it a lot, too. It was a really cool experience. I mean, he raised a really good point in our interview when he said it was a memorable t- title change. And you think about it, like in TNA's history, Impact Wrestling's history, yeah, that's definitely up there. People definitely remember that match. Yeah. And, I mean, and after the match, like the entire roster is asking me about it, like um, specifically. So it wasn't just like the 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 people in the stands that were buying in yeah. everybody. Yeah. And um, I think that uh, that type of situation is something that's missing from the business today. Mm. That suspension of disbelief in a, you can't go back to saying, I'm going to try to kill this guy for real. <laughs> that's it, like that day is past. That time is done, but stories can be real. People, can believe in me and believe in how I feel and how someone else feels. Yeah. And so issues can be real. And I, I think that's part of the way the business is going to evolve. What, what Austin was saying was it's no longer just about working them, working the fans. He's like, because a lot of the guys backstage are fans. And he's like, it's about working everybody now. And that's, I don't know what actually happened there. And, you know, there's only two people that really know what actually happened. It's you and Austin Aries, but I feel like everybody did get worked. Yep, including him. He maybe worked himself. That's <laughs> yeah. what happens when you get that crazy. You say a bunch of stuff and you lose track of what's real and what's not. Yeah. But, but yes, that is a good, um, I don't know, a good way to explain that situation. And that's like the goosebumps, like the, the feels, like the, un, like the unknown. You know what I mean? I mean, hey, the... Uh, infamous doors quote the reason they call their band the doors is there's the known and the unknown and in between are the doors Mm. the unknown on the other side out there is fascinating i feel like that's part of the draw Mm. of wrestling this business is the mystery so if you can find ways to bring that back into the business i think that's the evolution of it I feel like we're, this is such a different conversation. We're going than we pretty have. deep in this yeah. one. Yeah. I feel like I could, I'll link up the other one. Like, I'll put a link down below in the description. And you're like just joking around and doing springboards last time, huh? That was great. Yeah. If people, like, if people still comment on that video or still like will message me about that video. It's like, I, 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 I fully thought that you were going to just eat it. That's what you wanted me to do. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did. I did. You're like, do you think you can do a springboard? And I'm like, I never say no to anything. So I'm well, like, I like. I like it when people think, oh, wrestling's easy. I bet I can do a springboard. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Have, have a shot. Let's see what happens. And it was like a perfect springboard. <laughs> I don't, actually, I, got, I had my hands wrong. You landed on your feet. I landed on my feet. Surprisingly. Yeah. I think that there was like a 99% chance I was going to fall on my face, and I hit that 1%. It's on tape now. It, it, and I will never do, another, I'll dev- never do another springboard in the rest of my life. You don't have to. Because I got did a perfect one. springboard in John Morrison's backyard. <laughs> one and done. Sometimes you just got to know when to call it quits. This has been so much fun. And thank you for like inviting me over. Yeah, this has been great. Um, this is, uh, like we were saying earlier, before, before we started talking, it's nice to not have that lag time yeah. Like um, with, with all the Zoom interviews. And I can hear you. We're in the same room. We're in the same space. And um, like Zoom, it's look, pretty cool. Zoom is an incredible technology, Skype, StreamYard, whatever you happen to use. But even though we're in 2020, it's still slightly clunky. Yeah. Even, even if there's a half a second pause... It just makes and it a little words bit... get dropped sometimes too. It's... Right. You, I mean, yeah. here we're able to like kind of jump on what the other person's saying. In a Zoom call, it's like you got to wait, and then you can talk. Yeah, and I'll talk. Yeah. yeah, the waiting and talking takes the the humanity out of it a little. Yeah, bit. this is why Joe Rogan doesn't like to do these interviews virtually for that In exact Rogan. reason. And it makes sense. Yeah, you know? of course it makes. sense. You can't sense. like you can't see the guy. You can't read body language. Yeah. yeah. But everybody Don't get is- to see the Barricane poster. <laughs> That's- oh, I was also going to grab a... Uh, shoot, I was going to grab Presley. Oh, my God. One of, Presley- the star- one of the stars of Speed of Time. Yeah. 
Okay, let me grab. Okay. Let me grab Presley. I'll be. Okay. I'll I don't, be right back. Okay, I think that we'll actually pause this one. Okay, so time out. Time in. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, the is. the star, the true star of Speed of Time, Presley. He plays Doctor Bark Zuckerberg, <laughs> computer hacker of the future. What was your inspiration for Bark? He's a dog, a few words. He's really internalizing. I can see it in his eyes. He, does. he just, he just oh, takes he things yawning. in. He's yawning. How dare you? Wow. I think he said he wants bacon. Pretty sure that's what he said. Or cheese. I don't know. Who wouldn't want bacon? But, I, uh, I think this is a first. This is a first on the channel, on the podcast. Ooh. Yeah. Big time. Another yawn. Wait Are a minute. Press me? Quit yawning. Buddy. This is a big deal. Hey, buddy. We're on Chris's show. Yeah. We're talking about your movie. So um, Presley also is in The Speed of Time. Make sure to check it out. Tag him at the P-Boys if you've got any constructive criticism on his acting. See you, buddy. Um, he's just sauntering off. Hopefully he doesn't chew through a, a cord that's plugged into the wall. Ah. <laughs> he's not going to do that. I'm just kidding. Um, but the uh, so back, back to The Speed of Time... It, I'd been working with uh, Russ Nickel and William Stribling for years on a lot of projects. A, a feature that we had fully written that it, we all thought was pretty good, and another couple of uh, things. And um, before I went back to WWE, we realized, you know what, like, it would be really cool before I'm back on a full-time schedule to actually do something, yeah. um, something feasible. So that thing was the speed of time. They pitched this to me, and um, I immediately loved it. We got the city of St. Petersburg to, uh, to pitch in and give us some incentives, some partial funding, and um, access to some really awesome locations that we would not have otherwise it gotten. so good. Um, I got to work with people like, like Ziegler, uh, Nick Nemeth, and um, McColl, who plays Sergeant Badge Taker, who is uh, someone that I met through my acting coach. It's a, an actress that I've got a lot of respect for, and we had a really fun time on, on set together. And um, I think that uh, people are going to like this movie. And, and, and really, that's my goal of making movies. There's a lot of people who have uh, stories they want to tell for different reasons. And for me personally, I was always a big fan of wrestling and action movies because they let me dream when I was a kid. It was my form of escapism. Mm. So the speed of time, I think, nails it. It's got a very fast pace. It's kind of like Rumble in the Bronx meets Back to the Future meets Terminator meets 21 Jump Street. And it's a quick watch. Yeah. Yeah. It's very quickly paced. Yeah. So um, again, speed of time, 917. It's on Dust. It's on YouTube. It's on IGTV. It's on a bunch of places. Watch it. Check it out. Give it a like. Tell your friends. Share it. Comment it. Review it. Do stuff on IMDb, too, because that one's important. Did I forget anything? I don't Are there any other things? <laughs> Maybe you can shout out uh, this right here. Ooh, you guys, you guys see this thing? Yeah. I don't know if you've heard of uh, Loca clothing, but it happens to be Taya's clothing brand. And yeah. she's been um, working really hard at this. She bleach treated and tie dyed this shirt herself personally. And um, it's great for me because. I don't really shop for clothes anymore. You don't I just, have to. I just wear Loca stuff nonstop. And um, I get a lot of compliments on it because it, uh, it fits well. It's good material. And um, people usually tell me that I look put together now. And I never heard that before. Wow. Yeah. This is one of the first times that I've walked into a place and had someone say, like, oh, cool clothes. You look like you're matching or you're put together, <laughs> which, uh, which is great. So um, Loca is available at tayavalkyrie.com that's her shop and her fall line is uh coming mid-october we're gonna have a big announcement about that in mid-october maybe a party i mean a socially responsible yeah, small party yeah. of course and um go out on instagram live and show everybody all the uh, the new styles well if you have any uh you know, extra invites for that party Maybe you let me know. Oh, you're talking about yourself. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Sure we do. Yeah. I mean, that's a, uh, yep. Is this still on? Oh, wow. John, <laughs> so good to see you. Congrats on everything. Thanks again for having me. Thank you. World. Adios. Oh, I'm Presley. Presley. Yeah. Yep.
A well, big thank you to John and Presley for inviting me into their home. Thank you to Taya as well, even though we didn't see her on camera. And you know how they say you should never show up to someone's house empty-handed? Well, I showed up to John Morrison's house with a six-pack of White Claw. Mango-flavored White Claw, the best flavor, of course. Crazy to think that John Morrison, as ripped as he is, drinks White Claws. Speed of Time is available now, and check out that link down below this video to grab yourself a free toiletry bag from Tej Hanley. Oh, and those two videos that we talked about from the last time we did the interview at John Morrison's house? Oh my gosh, would you look at that? They're both right down there, the straight up interview, and then John Morrison teaching me wrestling moves in his backyard.